John chapter 4, verse 4 through 19. I got a bunch of scriptures to read, and so let's get right to it. Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 19, 4 through 19, and then we're going to jump uh, from verses 28 through 30, and, uh, and then actually we're going to jump from 28 through 30, then I'm going to jump from uh, 39 to 42. So we're going to jump for a little bit. If you've been in church and you went to Sunday school 101, 201, 301, then you've heard this woman's story 3.8 million times, uh, but I want you to uh, see this story with fresh ears. If you've never heard about this woman before at all, you've never read this uh, text, I promise you this text is going to minister to you today. Uh, and it says this, chapter 4, verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob and Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well and it was about noon. Remember that, it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, what? you're a Jew I'm a Samaritan woman how can you a Jew ask me for drink because Jews do not associate with Samaritans Jesus answered her girl if you knew who I was girl if you knew who I be girl if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. I'm checking you out. I'm looking at you. The well is deep. What you, how are you going to give me living water? Are you greater somehow than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Why are you giving me a history lesson when we talking about water? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Come on, push your neighbor and say, you'll never thirst. You'll never thirst. Come on, push your other neighbor and say, you'll never thirst. 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 He said, but this water will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Psh, you got my attention. Let's go, sir. Give me this water so I won't get thirsty. I don't want to come here at noon anyway. Sun's too hot. Uh, so what do I got to do to keep? Uh, get, could never come back here, never draw no water. He said, all you got to do, girl, is go home. Call your husband. Come back. She said, boy, I ain't got no husband. She replied, yep, you right. You ain't got no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you are with is not even your husband right now. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, oh, I can see you're a prophet. <laughs> Y'all remember when prophets came into town and you skipped that service, praise God? <laughs> you tried not to look them in the eye. You repented before you walked in because they might call you out. Verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man, told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They all came out of the town and made their way toward him. I laugh at that. I read a commentary this week that says that when the woman uh, went to the town and she said, I met a man who told me everything I did, that there may have been some men in the town that she had dealt with. And they were like, did he say my name? Did he say, did he say you was with Tyrone? Did, did he say Leroy? And so they went to make sure Jesus didn't know about them. Tell somebody, I love the Bible. You should read it more often. You should read it. John chapter 4, 39. Here's where I really want to preach. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Here it is. Then the woman said, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. The title of my message today is, I'm the one. Do me a favor, push the person next to you and tell them, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one. Look at the person who pushed you, say, you'll be the one if you ever touch me again a day in your life. All right, I read a lot of scriptures, so let's get right to it. Father, bless us in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, short prayers, long scripture. How many of you in this room in an overflow, you love your parents, make some noise? How 
many people understand that even though we love our parents, we don't want to live with them anymore? I do not recommend as an adult living with your parents. The beauty of parents is the fact that I get to visit and then leave. Well, they visit and then they go home. Not knocking you if you live with your parents because you're in a situation and you're trying to save money, you back in school, whatever you think, that's fine. But there should be a plan of escape. There should be some money going into an escape account because eight months, I'm gone. Six months, I'm gone. Because grown people, a grown adults should not live with no grown parents. I'm preaching better than y'all respond. Can I get an amen? We should be one of them churches that throw money. Y'all should be throwing money right now. Pick it up. Don't throw no money up here, please. It's grown. Just, I just, the reason why grown adults shouldn't live with parents because it gets confusing of who's in charge. It gets confusing of who gets to tell who what to do and what to do when. My mother is from Boston. She flew in last week. She's not here. She don't watch YouTube. So my mother flew in. Overflow, stop laughing. My mother flew in last week, and I mean, it was beautiful. It was great, but we kept having issues about who's in charge. If I wanted to sit down, she'd say, stand up. I'd say, Mom, why? I just stand up. You're my son. Do what I'm asking you. Okay, Mom. If I wanted to eat in, she said, you're not going to take me to a restaurant? You're not going to take me out? Okay, I guess we're going out. I sat down to watch TV. You're going to watch that? That's what you're going to watch? I guess not. I'm not going to watch this. At one point, she was literally telling me, to, can you iron something for me? I have not ironed in 20 years. I don't, I, can you just iron this? Mom, I don't know how to <laughs> iron it now. I'm like, Mom. She was just making me do random stuff. It's like, why are you walking like that? I don't, I don't know. Just <laughs> close your jacket, all right? Ma. Put your head up. Don't look down. Okay, mom. It was just crazy. <laughs> At one point, I had to remind, mama, you ever had to remind your parents how old you are? I had to look my mother in the eye and say, don't you know that I'm 41 years old? Give me my respect. Give me my money. Give me my money. Y'all better stop playing. That's why I say, give me my money. That's exactly what she did. I said, give me my money. She said, what? What are you talking about? I don't care how old you are. I don't care when you were born. You were there. I'm old. My mother's crazy. She'll show you the marks. She'll, she'll be like, look right here. This is where I got cut right here. You, you cut me right here. It's just, this was you. I'm like, all right, mom. Because it's a struggle to figure out who's in charge. Like, you know that when you're grown and your parents are around, you realize that your parent having a plan for you and you got a plan for you. And now we are playing tug of war on whose plan is going to win out. But you know that it's your mama, it's your dad. So you have no choice, but you got to surrender some of your stuff to them. In the same way in your relationship with God, God's got a plan for your life. The challenge is you have a plan for your life too. God has desires for you. The challenge is you have desires for you too. God has a, a will for you, but you have a will for yourself. And Christianity is you surrendering your will, surrendering your desires, surrendering your plans for God. Come on. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. You didn't know I could do that. You didn't know I could. Do that. You're not a singer. You don't know what that means. But you're supposed to be surrendering something. 
Hear me, when you come to church, don't ever get it twisted. I'm going to always preach something relevant to your life. I'm going to always talk to you about your marriage and your man and your money and your mind and your ministry and your stuff. But the reality of it is, in any of the topics we preach, what we are actually preaching is that you got to surrender your idea for it to God. You got to surrender what you think for what God believes about your life. Why am I bringing this up? Because last week, we announced that we were going to four services. And for the most part, the majority of the response was overwhelmingly positive. People said, Pastor, let's go. Let's do this. I know the people who used to be thugs because y'all come up to me like, yeah, we've been waiting. What you need, Pastor? Let's go. Five, six, seven. Come on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm just going crazy. Yeah. I'm just saying, people was like, what you want? But then we had a group of people, just a small group, who was like, really? Another service? <sighs> we were just trying to be one of the big churches. I was getting text messages from people in my family who said, who said, are you trying to kill yourself? <laughs> now, mind you, it's amazing to me. When people hear you trying to preach for services, they say, are you trying to kill yourself? Now, when I was sitting at the table with eating McDonald's and Wendy's and Chick-fil-A at the same time, y'all didn't say nothing about killing myself because I want to preach for services. I'm now trying to kill myself. But, <laughs> but, when, I, but when I had a 10-piece with a large fry and a large Sprite and two apple pies, nobody said nothing. <laughs> but now I'm trying to preach for services. Oh, you're trying to kill yourself. Be careful. <laughs> you should have been told me that, doc. It was just people who are just like, what are y'all doing? That's too much. You don't have enough volunteers. You don't have enough people. What, what is happening? Why in the world would you want to add a fourth service? Can I to make it simple to you? Because this is what God is asking us to do. Period. Can I, can I just be annoyed for a second? There are people like, y'all just trying to be a big church. Let me tell you something. If you knew the spiritual warfare attached to being a big church, you stop saying stuff like, that's all y'all want. No, 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 nobody sign up to all that spiritual warfare. Don't nobody want the devil coming at you all day. But when God puts you on the front line, there is a responsibility that he has for your life. And we the one. He picked us. Ain't nothing we can do about it. Now, 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 we can stay small to make small people feel comfortable. Or we can say, God, I've got a mandate, and I know it's going to stretch me, but God, you would not give me vision and not give me provision for the vision. Maybe, maybe, ooh, I feel like preaching right here. Maybe that's your problem. Maybe your vision is still too small. Maybe you need to expand it. Maybe the reason why God didn't give you no provision yet, because you don't need no provision, because your vision is still too small. Why don't you expand to another service? Why don't you stretch your mind and watch God fill something up? God, I need more money. No, you don't. What you going to do with it? I am telling you. I'm back. I'm telling you. Overflow, sit down. I'm telling you that God has put something on this church. There's nothing we can do. It's, it's, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. He has not put something on this church. He's put something on the church. It's not a name church thing. The church we are called to, all right, let me back it up with some scripture. Boop, boop. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Second Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness. Instead, he is what? Patient with you. Not wanting what? Anyone to perish. What if I told you that God, there are people in your life, he do not want to see them perish. He wants everyone to get an opportunity to come to a place of repentance. Okay, you need more scripture. I got more scripture for you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. 
He says, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants what? All people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. How, how many people does he want? All. All people to be saved. John 3.16. See, y'all know John 3.16, but you didn't read John 3.17. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God did not, for God did not send Union Church into Charlotte to condemn it. But that through Jesus, this city might be saved. Mark chapter 2, verse 16, 17 says, I got something for you, don't worry. I, when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, the healthy don't need no doctor." You know why sometimes, I, I, I don't know why I got this on me, but you know why sometimes people want a small church? Yeah, you want a small church because y'all all healthy. And y'all don't want no sick people up in there. Because you don't want nobody sneezing on your little exclusive community that y'all have. But that's not what we're going to be, no. He said, I didn't come here for no healed people. I came here for some sick people because I'm not trying to call more church folk. See, y'all want to go fishing in an aquarium because you want the fish that's already caught. But no, you don't need the fish that's already caught. You got to go to the ocean and you got to put out a net and say, God, bring me the sick people. That's why we're not trying to just be a big church. We are trying to... I believe this. What if God put us here for something greater? and something bigger than what we see right now. God's desire for you as a believer is to say my life counts more than just what it is right now. God is saying to us, no, there are people I'm trying to reach. There's a city I'm trying to win. There's, there's something that I'm trying to do. There's something bigger than what I see right now. What if God put a union here, not for union, but for Charlotte? What if God put you on the earth for something bigger than what you know? I know that you just want to just be cute. That's all we want. You want to be cute, get paid on the 1st and 15th, have a vacation every now and then, and that's all you want for your life. But the reality of it is, is that God wants more for you. God has more for you. And you got to walk in here every week and say, God, what is the mandate on my life? What is it that you want me to do? Hear me. What's that thing y'all all go to when you all trying to find somebody to Today uh, in Charlotte, what's that thing called? The thing called, well, y'all want somebody real bad? And so y'all just run the, oh, I know the, what'd you say? Not speed dating, mad mouths. That's what it is. Yeah, all you mad mouth people, yeah, when y'all just, when y'all want to find somebody, you find the tightest thing you ever been running in your life. <laughs> now, you know, good and well, you walk like this at mad mouths, you be like, <laughs> Maybe, overflow, sit down. Maybe there's more to life than a mad mom. <laughs> I'm in trouble, okay. <laughs> I'm really in trouble. <laughs> keep going, right? I gotta keep getting myself out of this. They laughing because it's true. Here's the deal. <laughs> this is why I read the story of the Samaritan woman. When we get to the Samaritan woman, the Bible says that Jesus has to go through Samaria. Jesus has to go through Samaria to meet the Samaritan woman. This is interesting. If you were in that day and you would have saw this, this would have blew your mind because Jews didn't go through Samaria. Why don't you go through Samaria? Because the Samaritans, they were considered an unclean group of people because these were Jews who were supposed to be pure and clean and 100% Jew and follow the Torah up to, to, right down to the T. 
right down, dotting every I. Somehow they got mixed up with some Gentiles, started taking on Gentile practices and Gentile gods. And so now you got these Jewish people who intermarried with these Gentile and these pagan gods. And so these are some people that got a little bit of God and they got a little bit of ratchet, rat- ratchetness. They got a little bit of righteousness and a little bit of righteousness. And so as a pure-blooded Jew, if you saw a Samaritan, you was disgusted because it was a sign that you took something clean and something pure and you intermingled it with something wicked and something not of God. So as Jews, they decided, I ain't messing with no Samaritan. Forget these Samaritans because God don't want these Samaritans. Jesus says, I go to Samaria. Why does Jesus go to Samaritan? He goes to Samaria and he messes with a Samaritan woman. Why? Because he's trying to show the church, stop telling me who to keep out of heaven. Stop trying to tell God who's not good enough to get in. Stop stop telling God or the church who we shouldn't try to go reach. Stop telling the church, just don't, don't expand, just stay like it is and let Samaritans die. And Jesus is saying, I'm showing my disciples that just because y'all don't mess with them don't mean God don't mess with them. And just because you don't like them don't mean God don't like them. And just because you don't see anything in their lives don't mean I don't see anything in their lives. And so what happens, Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman. When he gets with the Samaritan woman, I mean, this, is, this has to frustrate the disciples. I mean, this story is crazy. This story is crazy. Jesus, he, he literally gets to this well, and, and we know that he went over the top to get there because he's tired and hungry. He's so tired and hungry, the disciples leave him alone and say, stay here. They leave him laid up at a well to go try to buy him some food because they were so concerned because of probably the passion in which he was trying to get to this well. Now, mind you, he's getting there at noon. This is a weird time to be at a well. Why is it? Because, come on now, this is the Middle Eastern. If the sun at noon is beaming. So the only reason... To go to a well, you have to go early in the morning before the sun come out. Jesus knew she was going to be the only one there. Why? Because she's coming at noon. Why is she coming at noon? More than likely, she's coming at noon because there are people in the community who've been talking about her life and talking about her past that she don't want nothing to do with. And she said, right to avoid the gossiping girls in the community, I'm going to go there by myself. Now, we throw something in the text that the text don't say. Now, I know when everybody reads this, they got this woman who's the fastest woman in the world, and all she do is she's Mrs. Still Your Man and all that stuff. She just wants your man. She just wants your man. She had five husbands. It is possible that she had five husbands, and the dude she's with, is not. It, that's very possible. But that's not what the text says, which means what's also possible is that she had five husbands die. That she was married to one man, he died. She married the brother, he died. Married the other brother, because that's what they did in that. He died, and maybe the person that she's living with is the only family that would bring them in. We don't know. What we do know is that whatever's going on in her life, whatever's going on in her past, she did not think herself good enough to be around the other women in the city. But the Bible says that Jesus goes to this woman. If I'm a disciple, I'm upset. We did all this for her? You couldn't come up with a better woman? You picked her. Messed up her. Five husbands with a little man on the side. Her? Did Jesus? There were so many women. You could have picked an evangelist. You could have picked a prophet. You could have picked one of these good women. You could have picked one of these women who got six kids and they got her all together. You could have picked one of these women who takes care of her husband. You could have picked, why you come all the way this way to pick this person? Because God knew that 2,000 years later, there's going to be some people sitting in Union Church reading this text. And what God wants you to know is he will absolutely break his neck to go after a person that don't nobody else think deserves anything from God. Is there anybody in the room? I feel like 
preaching for a second, that can shout because God was patient enough to get through your crazy days to get you to a place where he can get you saved. I know you look clean right now, but let's talk about when you was dirty. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about when you was low down, dirty dog, shame. Is there anybody glad that God came and found you? That God came and rescued you? That he didn't leave you in that addiction? He didn't leave you in that bar? He didn't leave you at that dude's house? He didn't leave you with that abusive parent? He didn't leave you all by yourself sitting in a room with some medication saying I'm just going to take my life today but somehow a phone call, a preacher, a church, an Instagram, something that God used found you. Can I get at least 500 people and over for it in this room? Say pastor that's my testimony. I was a wretch undone. Come on, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch just like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Anybody used to be blind, but now you see, come on, it ain't nothing but a G thing, baby. What's that G thing? It was nothing but grace that saved me. Nothing but grace that picked me up. Nothing but grace that got me to where I am. Oh, you so cute now, but you used to be stank, ugly, jacked up, toe up from the flow up but look at you now yeah can you look at your neighbor and say look at me now you don't even know my story because you all you see is the glory of God on my life but I was a part of a gang yeah yeah I used to be in jail yeah don't move now you better stay right here cause I'll pray for your body come on I used to throw hands now I lay hands I used to be a dope dealer now I'm a hope dealer yeah yeah I used to lay people out in the street now I lay my hands down on somebody and lay them out in the church because he changed my life <laughs> Pastor Jimmy said don't forget where you came from and we've got too many people in the church who forgot you forgot you forgot you, you forgot and so we got to get to a place where you become like the Samaritan woman here is my thesis here's my point Here's what the Lord wants me to say. I don't think that God was thinking about the Samaritan woman. Why is that? Because when the woman gets this encounter with God, she runs back to the city. Now, I just told you she's been trying to avoid them. But when you get an encounter with God, the same people you should try to avoid, you now try to win to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same people you used to run from, you run to. So now she's going back, telling all these people, and the Bible says that they start believing, they start coming to see Jesus, and they start believing God. And now they beg Jesus to stay two more days. And now many of them believe. I don't think he was thinking about the Samaritan woman. I think he was thinking about Samaria. Because when God wants to save a city, he chooses a person. When God wants to change a family, he chooses a person. When God wanted to rescue Israel out of Egypt, he didn't send no army. He picked one man and gave him an encounter, put him on fire for God and told him to get in there. When God wanted to go speak to Nineveh and save that place, he picked Jonah. He picked one man. When he wanted to feed 5,000 plus men and women, he picked one boy with one lunch. Come on. When God wants to change your family, he picked one person in the family. And look at your neighbor and say, I'm the one. God picked you. You the one. I know you don't want to be the one, but that's that, too late. <laughs> Just like my mother not asking me, to do something she tells me to do. God's not, God not consulting you about this. God will let you cry. God will let you throw a tantrum. God will let you pretend like you don't hear him. God will let you go act a fool. And God will just sit there and wait you out. You ever have to wait your kids out? Until they finally surrendered their will to yours. And you told your kids I'm not breaking. I know some parents, they, they child being a store. <laughs> keep going like get out of this because this is trauma 
My kid did that one time. You know what I did? I sat right on the floor. I was like, yeah, keep going. We, I got right there in the store. I was like, we can both act crazy together, but one of us is going to stop in a minute, and let's see who wins this one. And by the time he got tired, and uh, are you finished now? Are you ready to get? All right, let's keep on going. And what God sees, some of you like, I don't feel like doing that. God will sit down and say, are you done yet? You done cry? You done throwing your tantrum? You done? You're, okay, you finished? All right, now get to where I'm asking you to go to. Because you're the one. You're the person in the family that he picked. All right, so then there's three things that you need to know. Three things you need to know. Are are y'all getting bored? Are y'all getting some out of this? All right, write this down. I'm trying to get you to see you're not normal. I need you to stop normalizing yourself. I'm trying to, because you will behave on the level you believe that you're called to. And if you hang out in an environment with pigs, you'll start talking like a pig and you'll start desiring pig food. But if you start hanging around kings and you start hanging around royal, you start realizing there's more to me than what I currently see. So I got to tell you that you're not normal. Here's three things you're going to write down. Number one, God wants to use your story. God wants to use your story. But pastor, my story is wrecked. Good. We need your story. But pastor, my story is boring. I ain't never slept with nobody I didn't, wasn't supposed to sleep with. I ain't never drank anything I wasn't supposed to drink. I ain't never smoked anything I wasn't supposed to smoke. I've always been in church. I've always done the right thing. I actually went to school for four years. I got out in four years. My story is boring. Yeah, we need that boring story. Because God wants to use your story. Whatever your story is, God will use it. I believe that God picked a Samaritan woman to change that region because he knew that her story would be... See, people have an idea of what a God person is supposed to look like. And God will radically change one person. And that person takes that story into a city. And they win everybody in that city because can't nobody believe that God would pick that person. You the person God picked... But pastor, I'm divorced. Yep, use that story. But pastor, you know how much abuse I've been through? You know how much abuse I've done? Use that story. Pastor, don't you understand my story? It's just, I, I, I had low self-esteem my entire life. Yep, use your story. Hear me. People, I'm going to tell you one of the things that frustrate people about church. I have to say this because church people uh, they have, you become nose blind. You ever heard of that phrase? You know what nose blind is? Nose blind is when you are in a room for so long, you no longer knows what it smell like because you're just so used to the smell that somebody can come in here and be like, you don't smell that? No, I don't smell anything. That's why people put too much cologne on because you, 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 you're nose blind. You don't know that you put it on, but you can't smell it no more, so you keep adding more. And everybody's like, my God. You're overdoing it. The person don't know they're overdoing it because they nose blind. Church people get nose blind. So you, you've been in church so long, you can't smell what church feel like. I'm, I'm going to help you understand what church feel like. When people come into church, it's like I'm sitting here and I'm looking at people and I'm like, yep, I'm never going to be able to worship like that. I'm never going to pray like that. Mm-hmm. I ain't never, yep. I, I'm, look at their marriage. I'm never going to have a marriage like that. Yep, look at their kids well behaved. Never going to be, my kids not going to ever do that. And so I'd rather not come in here and feel bad about myself. I'd rather just go get some mimosas and go to a brunch where I can feel good about my life than come in here on a Sunday and feel horrible. Because what people really want to know when they come to church is, is anybody struggling like me? Is anybody dealing with something like Because I just need to know that somebody else is, let me tell you, this is why groups are so powerful. When you are in a group, people can tell the truth. And people start saying, yep, we got in a big old argument before church. And you start saying, are you serious? Y'all getting in arguments before church? Yeah. Oh my God, me too. God. Yeah, man, me and my son went out. Your son said that to you? Yes. Oh my God, I'm not the only, I thought my son was the only crazy son. People want to know that you are a real person. 
People want to know that you got real stuff going on because now that I know that you're real and I see you worship, I know that you're going through some stuff and I see you pray, it means something different to me because it means if God with your situation can use you, then my God, he can use me. You know why Jesus picked a Samaritan woman? So that everybody, every other Samaritan can say, if God picked you, then my God, he'll pick me. If God delivered you, he can deliver me too. I know this is bad, but I just want to know that my kids aren't the only crazy kids. You ever, you ever be glad somebody else's kids is crazy? And you're like, whoo! We had this one time where me and my wife was on a fast, and we were fasting, and, and I was struggling on this fast. I mean, I mean, I was dreaming about food. I was just, I was doing crazy stuff. I would open the bag of chips and just smell it and just, whew. I didn't eat it, but I was just open it, just, but I was looking at my wife, and she just looked like she was so happy. She just looked like she was just like she was just nothing was bothering her. She looked like air was hamburger. Like she was just, you just, she was just good. And, and I'm supposed to be the man of God. First of all, I'm a Christian. Then I'm a leader. And then I'm competitive. So I'm like, how is she doing this? Like, and I'll be praying, God, whatever you gave my wife, give to me because I'm about to break this fast. And so I was almost leaving food around, hoping to tempt her because I wanted her to eat it first. And then I was going to be like, oh, oh, I guess you couldn't make it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let the man of God get you straight. Because if she broke, then I could break and we could get off this fast. And so I'm just like, man, she's not touching on food. I'm just like, I'm sweating. I'm like, God, how are we doing? You ever get on a fast and then talk yourself out of it? Like, did I really hear God? Like, did I? <laughs> you know, I'm going to mess with some people. I'm sorry, I was gonna say something really bad. It's like, it's like a God tell you quit your job, you never get confused. But when he tell you to fast, you'd be like, did I hear God? It's like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> At one point, I go to my wife, I said, forget it. I can't take it no more. I'm done. I went to my wife, I said, hey, aren't you hungry? You're not hungry? She said, what are you talking about? I said, we're on this fast. Are you hungry? Like, you're not hungry at all. Oh, folks, stop laughing. She's like, I'm absolutely hungry. I, I, I've been wanting to eat something for the last couple of days. I said, why do you look so good? Like, why are you so chipper? She's like, I'm trying to look good for you because I'm thinking he's the man of God. I don't want to. I'm, I'm trying to be strong for him. I said, girl, I wanted to break this thing two days ago. <laughs> what? And so we just held each other. Just like, why, why are we doing this? I felt so much comfort in <laughs> knowing that she was just as hungry as me. There are people who come to church who are like, you struggle with doubt too? Yeah. Oh, you don't know every scripture either? I thought it was just me. Oh, you don't always, you're not always in the mood to worship. I just thought you come every time I see you, you got your hands in it. You the first one worshiping. Nah, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I was struggling to get here. But I'm pushing through. And now your testimony is inspiring me. And my testimony is inspiring somebody else. That's what the church is supposed to be about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. It says, Christian brothers, think who you were when the Lord called you. Not many of you were wise or powerful or born into the family of leaders of a country. But God has chosen the God has chosen what the world calls foolish to shame the wise. He has chosen what the world would call a weak person to shame the people that look strong. Why? Because God is showing his power. Here's the second thing I need you to write down. Number two is that people are hungry for a real encounter with God. Hear me loud and clear, Union Church. Overflow. Last week, we gave out 10,000 invite cards for Welcome Home Sunday. They have no cards left. I am telling you that when you give out those invite cards, there are people who are starving for a real encounter with God. 
Do not let social media fool you. I am telling you, I'm traveling the world. There's a hunger for God like never before in this country. And you know why? Because the world has been exposed. The solutions that the world has given to help solve your issues, we are finding out it don't work. Every promise that the world has given on how to get you more comfort, more fulfillment, more happiness, more just do this, try this, taste this, go here. They are now realizing this made me more depressed, this made me more anxious, this made me more medicated, this has messed me up more. Everything that I heard on social media about what I should be doing with my life, people are finding out it's not working. I, you can speak to any mental health therapist right now. They will tell you the industry is booked. Why? Because mental health is at an all-time high. Why? Because everything we try to make ourselves more happy, to make ourselves more skinny, to make ourselves more rich, to make ourselves more happier, has made us more dark, more demented, more depressed. More. We have jacked ourselves up. And I am telling you, the reason why we're going to force services is because there are people in this city who are saying, I need more, and we've got the more that they need. They need more Jesus. They need more. People don't need another club. They don't need another liquor store. We don't need another ABC store. We got enough ABC store. We need more union church. So don't tell me they can put a liquor store on every corner, but if I expand the service, what you doing too much? No, tell the liquor store that. No, no, tell the strip club that. Don't tell the church that we added too much. No, 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 no. Go to the club and tell them they're adding too much. How come everything the devil do, they can expand, but if God want to expand something, y'all doing way too much. No, no, no. We ain't doing enough yet. We're not doing enough. So Starbucks can build right across the street from, they got one Starbucks on this side, they put another Starbucks right across the street. You know, y'all don't say nothing. But if the church at a campus, we do big, Y'all doing too, that has to stop. That is a trick of the enemy. That is a trick of the enemy. Hear me, the world is realizing it's not working. I had this dude came to me a couple years ago. He said, Pastor, I'm sick of my wife. I want out of this marriage. I just, I just want out of this marriage, man. He said, Pastor, you don't understand. It is these girls outside, man. These are some of the finest girls I've ever seen in my life. He said, come on, I'm telling you the truth. He said, Pastor, I got to go outside because he's just the finest one I've ever seen in my life. And they flirting with your boy. And I just, I, and I'm going home and, and she don't look that good. And she just, I'm just, uh-uh. I want to go outside. And I try to talk him out of it. Hey, man, come on, man. Just fight for your marriage. Try to give him scripture. Try to give him the word. And he's like, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm getting outside. And so he went through. He got divorced. He went outside. He called me two months later. He said, Pastor, it is crazy out here. I just want to go back inside. I'm sorry. I just, I just want my my wife back. I don't know what I was thinking. He was outside for two months and he just said, it's crazy out here. Can I get a single person to look at a married person and say, y'all don't want none of these problems. You better stay inside. Look at a married person and say, can you stay with your spouse? You do not want to be out here. It is crazy out here. We will literally call you here and pop a balloon in your face. We so crazy. We will pop a balloon in your face. Pop just uh, pop. Let me tell you something. There's some people who are they are triggered for life. You know that mental health? That half of the people in mental health had a balloon pop in their face. Every time they hear pop, you're ugly. Pop, you're too short. Pop, you're dark. Pop, you're a balloon. Now when you people hear bullets pop, is somebody breaking up with me? No. I grew up in a time where if she didn't like you, she didn't really say it. <laughs> they at least made up something. Oh, I have cancer. I can't be with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just found out I have cancer. I can't. And you said, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm sorry. Just <laughs> me see her years later. I thought you had cancer. Oh, it got cleared up all of a sudden. Just I got healed really quickly. <laughs> It was like a 24-hour cancer. It's just no. Today, y'all be like, "So what is it, William? How old I pop in their face?" I'm saying, Mary, this is crazy. Because the devil makes it look tempting. Matter of fact, let me just say this: the only reason why she even wants you 
is because of your purpose and your anointing and the favor on your life. So now you don't left your spouse and lost your favor. You don't look the same. You're not as cute as you was with the ring on. Push your neighbor and say, who is he talking to? I don't know who is he. Is he in your business or who is he speaking on? Matthew 11, verse 20 through 30. Scripture says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Whew. God says this world is looking for a real encounter. Here's my last point. Musicians, you guys can come out and I'm going to pray for you. My last point is this. <sighs> One person can turn a city upside down. Hear me when I say this. All God needs is one person to catch fire, one person to get some real faith, one person in the, God needs one person in your office to be serious for him. It changes the company. One person, maybe you are the house in your community and you're saying, why are we still on the street? You're still on that street because maybe you are the house that God needs on the street because there's a person on the street, on your city, in your community that God wants to move on. I have a neighbor. I got some crazy neighbors. And uh, I have this one gentleman who's just extra crazy. Just just crazy out of his mind. And every time I see him, he's crazy. He, he has animals. He walks around with animals on him. He has, he has a, a, like, a, like parrots on him. And he just walks around. And he just, I just, I stay away from him at all costs. And uh, one day I'm coming around the corner. And when I get around the corner, I guess he's sitting in his truck. When I get around the corner and I move around, he, uh, he uh, gets out of his car. He says, what are you doing? Back up. Get off my truck. I'm sick of this. Get in. Blah, blah, blah. Said a couple of words that was, had a little cussing in it. So I, I pull up. <laughs> I pull up on him. Huh? I come around, pull up on him. I roll down the window. I said, excuse me, what you say? He said, man, I'm sick every time I try to go on my driveway. Y'all back up on me. I can't even get it in my driveway. I said, sir, I had no idea you was trying to get in your driveway. I said, I, I didn't even see you, man. I said, dude, that's totally my fault. I didn't even know that's what you was doing. I can back up. He was like, man, man, I'm sorry, man. He started crying. He said, man, I just, I just found out I got cancer. And he said, it's, I, I, it's just been messing me up. I said, hey, man, let me pray with you. And so I prayed with my guy, and uh, he said, man, thank you. And, and now we the best of friends. And now I be having parrots on me, and he had parrots on him. And we be talking, and he be like, man, I'm going through this, going through that. Why? Because God just need one person who don't have an attitude, one person who don't stoop down to everybody else's level, one person who say, I'm going to raise my kindness, one person who says, I'm going to live for God. Because God, if he wants to change a city, he just puts one person with favor one person with an anointing do me a favor overflow high five everybody around you and say I'm the one yeah yeah I'm the one he picked I'm the one he's using I'm the one he chose that's why I'm blessed that's why I'm favored that's why I gotta win because if I win then God can use my testimony to bless everybody connected to me that's why God says I'm gonna be the head not the tail that's why I'm gonna be above and not beneath that's why I'm gonna be the lender and not the because if he blessed me, he blessed my city. If he blessed me, he blessed my family. If he blessed me, everybody connected to me is going to experience the favor of God. Do I have anybody in the room that says I'm the one? Yeah. When I pray, my family is going to pray. When I got saved, everybody about to get saved. When I get blessed, my city going to get blessed. Union Church, we the one. That's why he picked us, because we the one. That's why we added a service, because we the one. That's why we got a overflow because we the one and if God blesses us everything we touch got to be blessed if God uses us everything we touch got to be healed everything we touch got to be anointed everything we touch got to be favored last scripture I promise I'm done because I got a parking team that's going to yell at me Genesis 39 verse 2 last scripture 
it says that the Lord was with Joseph and he succeeded in everything he did. Keep that scripture up. The reason why you're the one, because the Lord's with you. If the Lord's with you, you will be successful in everything you do. I want you to do this and then we're going to pray because I'm over time. The Bible says the Lord is with Joseph. He's successful in everything he did. When I first read the scripture, I identified it with myself. And I used to say to myself, the Lord is with Brian. And I'll be successful in everything I do. If I ever felt doubting myself, I would quote this scripture. I'll say, the Lord is with Brian. And I'll be successful in everything I do. Can you do that right now? Can you say your first name? Can you repeat that and say, the Lord is with your first name? And say, I will be successful in everything I do. Come on, say it right now. Come on, say it. Say it. Come on, say it again. The Lord is with Joseph. Come on. The Lord is with Tamika. Come on. The Lord is with me. And I'll be successful in everything that I do. Come on. Say, the, say it again. Keep saying it. Come on. The Lord is with Percy. Come on. Come on. Come on. The Lord is with Justin. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord is with Stephanie. Everything. I, I will be successful in everything I do. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? If God is on my side, then one can chase a thousand. Two can put ten thousand to fight. What if God is on my side? Then no weapon formed against me will prosper. Because my name is Brian and the Lord is with me. And I'll be successful in everything that I do. If you're in this room, you're in overflow. I need every head bow, every eye closed. I want to pray for you and I want to pray that today you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I need everybody to repeat this prayer. Say, Father, come on, if you're praying this prayer for the first time, God's going to honor the faith of your words. Overflow. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. I repent today as an act of my will. I turn from the practice of wrongdoing and I give my life to you. I know there's more in me. And today, I surrender my life to you. I believe Jesus is Lord and today I am saved come into my heart save me now I am yours and you are mine in Jesus name everybody say